So um, there was a interesting study that you did uh, with a gentleman, I forget his name, on DNA work, on, on the extracts. Oh, yeah, Dr. Zach Jones. Dr. Zach Jones, correct. So let's talk a little bit about that because I'm a big proponent of diversity, diversity, diversity. And um, one of the things, the foundation of my product, obviously, is fish manure or fish poop. Um, but I also always use worm vermicompost as well as my own uh, compost that I made wherever I was working at the time. And I noticed something that was really interesting about the work that he did for you, showing incredible diversity in across the boards in, in your vermicompost. So what was your key to that? Because was it the bedding? Was it the food scraps? I mean, how did you get that level? Yeah, I mean, I just focus on a diversity of feedstocks all the time. Um, so, you know, there's multiple things going into my bin. And I'm always just trying to focus on maintaining an environment that's going to promote um, more fungi, especially, obviously, but uh, microorganisms and special in general. So, um, yeah, it's just it's mainly the management style making sure you know i have a good amount of foods rather than just have you know straw and wood chips and one other thing or you know just a few feedstocks diversity in feedstocks and then really um a good management style so do you remember richard mitchell yeah 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 he's not far we talk oh do you still see him i haven't seen him but we chatted on the phone oh nice nice i haven't chatted with him in a few months but <laughs> Talk about another wildcat. <clears throat> you know, he was he was out of the blue. Uh, land crash landed there to do uh, vermicomposting at the time. Yeah, and I loved his style. Um, his his style was to go take uh, bales of hay um, and create a room um, at a at a organic farmer's uh, site. Um, and then he built a, like a volcano bed in the middle. Um, with the bedding for his worms, he'd, he'd lay the worms in there and then he'd have the farmer just throw the scraps at the pile and whatever hit the pile, it didn't stick. It rolled down or down the base and, and up against the hay bales. So it had like a kind of like automated feeder. So the worms could be in their bedding or they could come out and, and gorge, but they never got stuck in that like kind of anaerobic pocket. Um, maybe right. you have some other tricks for the audience on how to prevent that, because that's generally, you know, the big, bad experience that a lot of people have when they try to vermicompost that they end up turning the whole thing into anaerobic soup. Yeah, the number one problem with vermicomposting with people that people run into with vermicomposting is that they're not adding any or not adding enough uh, carbonaceous or brown materials. So they're, you know, they're like, oh, I'm composting my food scraps and I'm turning this into fertility and they're only really focusing on the food scraps when they really need to be focusing on as an equal amount or more of brown material at the same time. So every time you're putting in two cups of food scraps, you should be putting in two to four cups of brown material like shredded paper, cardboard, uh, leaf mold or something like that. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, that's always been a big um, question is like preparing the bedding properly. And I remember um, Richard used to get a lot of leaf mold, and he would he would definitely have um, at the time uh, the first exposure I had to really fungally dominant worm castings. And so I assume you're doing a similar kind of ratio to get that fungi level up. Yeah. Um... I uh, I use leaves as much as I can, or I'm just trying to use as much brown material as I can. So I'm generally pre-composting material where I'm, it, that can be like a new term, but it's basically putting compost through the thermophilic process or getting it to begin to decompose and then feeding it to worms. So rather than throwing a fresh banana peel on top of my worm bin, I'm getting that that banana peel to break down a bit and then feeding it to the worms. Very cool. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, you had asked me a question. I forgot what it was that I was going to answer other than that. Uh, so it was about getting fungally dominant. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, uh, one thing I have noticed uh, is you would think that Lee. So I've compared compost. I've made you know I've made so much compost in the past however many years and tested it. So I'm always researching. I'm not necessarily keeping track of the results in a in a digital format or whatever, but it's in my head. And you would think that wood chips or a wood chip dominant pile would you know give you tons of uh fungal foods because you've got those nice wood chips and things like that so i've kind of compared wood chips to leaves and um you know leaves are going to be just as much carbon but you would think that there's going to be more carbon and foods in a in an actual wood chip or you know in the uh tissue of the wood but I found that I generally get the most fungal dominant compost or more fungi when I'm using a lot of leaves, which makes sense if you think about it, because every year nature is feeding the soil all of this carbon in leaves to feed that fungi in the soil. So it's nature's food source for foods. You know, nature isn't necessarily chopping up wood and throwing it down. It's putting down leaves every year. Yeah, that's a that's a great. Now, do you. Uh... Do you harvest the leaves after they fall or do you let them start to break down before you add them to your bed? Um, I'm, it's leaves that have fallen in the autumn that uh, either I've collected or other people have collected that I'll, you know, get and then use for as a feedstock. Nice. Um, because the reason I ask that is that I've noticed that when you allow the leaves to uh, leave them for a while, so that they're not like just freshly raked up, but they're actually starting to pile up and, and start to compact and create wet layers and so forth that you get a, a explosion of, um, you know, endophytic fungi that come out uh, and convert to saprophytic. And so that was, that has always been my you know, secret sauce to uh, building my compost is that I will extract leaves uh, that have spent, you know, at least six months um stacked up on themselves uh and perhaps over obviously over the winter uh and then harvest them in the spring is are you doing a similar practice or yeah that good point uh so most of the leaves that i've collected are not freshly fallen i've they've been in a bag for three six nine months so yeah they're aging and broken down some or or i would put them through a shredder Got you. So very similar practices. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so Ken, I don't know if, if you found that um, that pie chart that shows the diversity of what uh, Troy accomplished in in his uh, vermicompost DNA extract or extraction. But if you can pull it up when, um, and then just put it up on the screen when you can, that'd be fantastic. 